Okay, so now is the time uh, to answer all those questions that you have been thinking of during the whole afternoon. Please, you have all the experts in front of you. Who wants to start? You're only taking photos. <laughs> oh, do this with I'm, I'm going to uh, play a little bit the devil's advocate um, uh, to b begin with, and I think this is kind of an open question, um, but maybe it's for the people mostly who had the closest connection with the uh, interval. What kind of uh, cause and effect do you see uh, in terms of where the uh, cattle industry has gone um, between the, we talk about um, um, genetic diversity, for example, and the size of the uh, breeding populations and the concentration of agriculture in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Is there a, is there a direct correlation between how successful the Interbull project was and the fact that we have a, a much different um, dairy industry, for example, with farms with 600 or 60,000 cows milking and almost no small farms anywhere, at least in North America, uh, milking. <clears throat> and the question is then, will this project potentially do something similar for the horse industry? So as I say, it's a bit of a devil's advocate because I think we have to know potentially what the impact could be and whether it's the impact that we really want. We're all seeking that elite sport horse, but are we going to lose genetic diversity? Are we going to lose the flavor of the art of breeding? Um, uh, so to speak, and, and the landscape of the industry. Is it going to be uh, three large breeding farms with uh, a thousand stallions each and the rest of us, uh, you know, one or two mares or not? That's, you know. I can't stop. You can talk. I think there are two important questions that you put up, really. The one about genetic diversity is very interesting, and it's different in different breeds. And it's also a question about how was the development of genetic diversity going before the interval came into picture. And my recollection of that was that people were running after the same bulls all over the world, independent of what they knew about how they would fit to the different environments. When we introduced the genetic correlations, it meant that we got different rankings in different countries. And actually, the top bulls in one country was not definitely the same top bull in another country. So it counteracted the uh, narrowness of the genetic diversity, in fact, by applying those genetic correlations. Then the general figure is, of course, that you get access to the whole global population. And uh, that could have meant otherwise, if you d didn't have the different rankings, that you were running after the same bulls. But that's what they did before we did it. That's my uh, recollection of that issue. And I've looked at the uh, inbreeding coefficient of several breeds. It's more prominent or more clear with an increased inbreeding within the Holstein breed, which is the biggest breed compared to some of the others, where you did expect otherwise that the uh, inbreeding would be larger in the smaller breeds. So I think the effect of interval has been positive in general because it gives an opportunity to analyze the situation on a global scale. I don't know whether Reinhardt has something more to add to that. I may add a few things to the horse industry. The same applies to the horse industry, I think, but it is different in a way that I have the experience that horse people always look for something new. They want to be a little different. All of them doesn't work, do not uh, run after the same individuals because they want to mat market something that is a little different from what anybody else has. And that counteracts the inbreeding situation. And the studies I have seen doesn't in, in, uh, mean that there is a threat to the inbreeding level within the warm blood sport horses. There are so many populations all around the world and they have different origins, although they are more commonly using the same stallions. But I don't think there will be a problem with inbreeding, really. You have to look for it in the individual case all the time. But I don't think it is a general problem to be. 
Uh, I would like to agree with Jan on most of the points because I think we would have had more inbreeding without interbull because of the fact that what Jan said that, for example, uh, the European uh, breeds and the Euro European population was also part of the global, I would say, gene pool that, that could be selected from, whereas without interbull it would have been just uh, the U.S. Yeah, one question up there, in the middle. <coughs> Uh, from a genetic point of view, when you have the same stallions breeding all over the world, uh, your, your genetic population will turn into a, into a favored population rather than into a common population. And that always uh, presents a problem. Like recently we have had this discussion with the WFFS syndrome that has now spread all over the world. And uh, there is a, a movement towards uh, recording this data, which is very well, but still the, the problem remains that you uh, make more choices because of a successful stallion, so to speak. So you narrow your gene pool and you, you you introduce more genetic uh, 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 mutations. Please. I may start off the response to this. I think the most important thing is that we have a good recording of defects. And that has been so in the cattle breeding. We have had a number of defects that has been eliminated out of the populations because we have had enough use of some of those bulls that were found. Previously, they were not discovered. We had the defects, but we, they were not discovered because there was not clear reporting and was not big enough groups where they could find them. So we have very good examples, but there is no guarantee that there is no mutations coming up, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. But the better recording we have on a global scale, the better it is for an opportunity to combat those defects in the population. Each of us in this room contains, I think, has gotten in his meiosis when the uh, cell from the, from the father and the mother are melted together, I think between five and seven mutations. So I think uh, we will have mutations every generation, and as Jan said, it's a kind of a monitoring, and uh, this uh, more informative data gives us also the handle to use it. Uh, to, to work with it in a, in a breeding program. You cannot get rid of mutations. And I think mutations is not a question if you use few sires or, or many sires or so, they just are there. And if they are connected to, to uh, important traits like jumping ability or dressage things, then they go and spread in your population and after some generations they pop off and if you have mating of two that have the same recessive allele. We have another comment from Catherine Stock, and then we go for the question up there. Yeah. Just, a, just a brief uh, additional comment, because y tomorrow you will also receive the, the brief report from, from what's going on in science. So, and I will give you a, a short insight into a recent study we have performed on WFFS, uh, just to, to track and, and to, to uh, show uh, where it comes from, how it spreads. So, so uh, our, yeah state of, of uh, status quo, uh, what we know about it. Um, for sure, it's not new, this mutation, so it's just that we have discovered it. And if it's, it's another piece of information we got. And if we are able to, to use the maximum amount of data and make best choice of it, of all we know, uh, and add on, for example, worldwide information about other traits we are interested in, and it's not only highest level performance. Already in the break, many people approached me, well, do you think it's possible with additional traits, other traits? So we are all have our different opinions about what the best horse is. And so it's, it's many, many tiny pieces of, of the puzzle. And if you put it together, it means optimum use of data. And, and so uh, the more collaborative and international we get, the better choice we can make. So, and you, you cannot avoid any mutation, any defect, any, uh, I don't know, not optimum level of some trade in, in a di some horse if you close your eyes. So it's really use the maximum of data. 
I have two uh, questions. The first one is for Reinhard. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, first said uh, the car was not a horse, um, but you will make one word uh, interesting for me. It was uh, the temperament. Um, how do you score the temperament of a horse? And how do you go, go with that uh, information or the property in your uh, uh, numbers? You mean uh, on a horse or on a cow? No, on a horse, huh? You said uh, on the one of the last sheets you said we have for the horses a temperament of the horse. So that was interesting. How how do you calculate? How do you score that point? Yeah, I, I just made the, the comment that uh, for um, that the trait temperament in cattle, which is um, uh, mainly relevant, how uh, nervous a cow is in the milking parlor, and if it's in robotic milking, how often she disturbs uh, the the milking that that is a complex trait and that th that is the same as uh, the debate about what is the right um, definition of temperament for horses. I, I don't have a, a so solution or an answer, a concrete answer for horses for you. Because it's the inside of the horse who makes the, the, the performance to perform for a horse. So that's the, the complexity and not that, that you make it eagle like a cow and that's for me not, yeah, not eagle. So you have uh, in the cow world a lot of properties you can uh, calculate and you can uh, see it how it is and uh, you can yeah and that's that's the more complex for the horses, also for dressage the same. I, I agree with that. I agree. Okay, thank you. I have the one uh, for the last one for Asa. Uh, you you showed us the uh, the top five for the dressage. I was a little bit too late for uh, the picture of the, the jumping horses, but I, I uh, in mind I have uh, the Neo is 26. Uh, Ribaldi said 26 of age. Jazz is 28, the other one, uh, Florestan is 33, and the other one is 38 years. Uh, it is a very passive uh, method to show us the results. We know we have to know it when we are four or five years old. So, yes, how yes. do you get that information? This was only to show uh, how it, this was related to the top stadiums ranked for, for, uh, from the World Breeding Federation. And it, was, it is all data because we did this project a few years ago, of course. So, yeah, so that it was compared to the ranking for board breeding. Hello, um, this is more of an open question or for those that worked within Interest Stallion. Um, so we were talking at the beginning about how people, breeders are now, they're not so fussed about what stud book they're going to, they just want to breed what they're looking for. Um, in terms of promoting genetic gain in indirect traits that also enhance competition, but longevity and durability. Is it possible and is it necessary to have a standardized linear profiling scale so that s breeders can cross compare across stud books? Um, mm -hmm. And then the second point is, how do we, <laughs> you were saying about reducing noise, so how can we promote inter-observer reliability within those different stud books? Because that will have an impact on the, mes the <laughs> estimated breeding values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I may comment on this because I've, I've uh, particularly with the linear profiling, I've quite, quite a lot of work done there. Uh, we have these international meetings where we really uh, try to get uh, as many people uh, as possible together from the stud books, really the judges doing the linear profiling in the different stud books to do some work on the harmonization issue. But still we have some um, very well, uh, used uh, linear scale, which is quite comprehensive. Many stud books are using it successfully, but we have also other uh, stud books using uh, their own uh, smaller, different, whatever linear system. It also works quite well. And the, from the study which I've reported from, it's uh, not that we have the uh, uh, same linear schemes in Sweden and in Germany, but we have identified that, uh, which is actually extremely plausible, that the most uh, important, the most informative traits are very, very similarly in, in similar in their definitions. And so uh, the correlations were highest also for these traits. And for those where we thought, well, it sounds more or less similar, but yeah, not very exactly in the, uh, the same definition, then the correlations were lower. So this pattern was also as we expected on the level of the breeding values. And this support that there is always some noise, and uh, the noise will be reduced the better we get in harmonization, standardization of the recording, but it's still possible if we are not very close at this 100% identity of how we handle these schemes. 
it's it works. It it's possible. So, so may I add something? I may, that, sorry. I may just comment upon the question about the durability of the horses. I had one student that made a thesis on analysis of the number of successful competition years, and it shows a large variation in that trait if you measure it in comp competition years. So there are opportunities to make use of the competition data in different ways, mm -hmm. not only to look at the yeah. best performance, but also how long time they are performing. Mm -hmm. so, so just to clarify, a question for Orsa and Catherine. So we, we ha in this seminar, we have focused mostly on breeding values, including competition results, which would then be uh, br breeding values that makes ranking of stallions um, possible, but they actually do not say anything about the strengths and weaknesses in the inheritance of each and every stallion. So would international genetic evaluation be feasible also for linear traits? And how would that benefit the breeders in that case? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then you can uh, make the perfect match. M not perfect, but you can have help to make the matching between mare and stallion easier. So it would be a good way to complement the valuating of yes. breeding values. Yes, mm -hmm. different kind of values. Yes. Why not? Yeah, but, uh, but I have also to, to mention that uh, we started with type traits was the second trait group in, in dairy cattle. Mm -hmm. And we had the same uh, genetic correlations as we have seen it from your studies, between 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and 0.9. But we had then to improve the data collection. Uh, the breed association had to do it because the outcome was if you, you put a, a correlation of 0 0.7 into the genetic, in the MACE procedure, then you have so much re-ranking and a top uh, sire or a, a very extreme uh, genetic evaluation for a horse in Sweden, for example, if you have only a 0.7 correlation, would go very much to the mean. And that is not what the farmers or the, the breeders accept, of course, because they say, okay, that cannot be that. He is uh, very uh, extreme for, for that trade in, in Sweden. And in Germany, with the same horses, with the same uh, bloodlines and so on, he is so much lower. So we had to do a lot of work to bring them more or less all up to 0.9. Then the breeders accepted it, and the re-ranking was not as significant as you, have, as you will find it with a 0.7. Just a brief comment to defend our correlations, of which were, some of them were, were rather low or appeared rather low. Uh, we entered this collaborative uh, project where we were, yeah, not really at the beginning, but at an at an earlier stage of, of the development. So it was really uh, we used the results from a prototype of genetic evaluation and, and used it with or combine it with more research level. So the reliabilities of the breeding values were rather low. And we, uh, what, what I've shown was really the pure correlation, so not adjusted for the reliability. So we, we used only uh, or considered all the stallions with just five progeny, uh, a minimum of five progeny. So the, the less reliable the breeding values are, the more uh, the correlations shrink are reduced because yeah well it's it's not on, on equal levels so so the similarity of the ranking was was even closer and and I think which when we now today would perform the study and would extend it we would uh, have improved and so we would have uh, better chances for more trades to to get at, at really higher levels so so I think we are on a good good way in this this new field of trades so just, uh, do you have another question? I have there? a question, yes. <clears throat> um, when I first started uh, using frozen semen um, a number of years ago, the uh, industry was such that a young stallion that was quite successful at the performance test was available at a relatively low cost because everybody was breeding with the successful stallions, with the mature stallions that ha had a good result. Um, subsequently, We've been watching the genetic um, uh, process going on in some of the other species like chickens and, and pigs, and I have neighbors who have been heavily involved in the development of, of uh, pigs. And they no longer are doing the ROP, they're not doing record of performance because 
their sires don't live that long, what they're doing, and they're making a tremendous genetic progress, or at least they, they continue to tell me this, um, simply by taking the high performers from each generation. And that that, for both chickens and for pigs, has resulted in, in, in fast um, uh, genetic progress. So the question is within the horse industry, because we talked about how old a stallion is before he has sufficient progeny to really do a fair evaluation from a competition point of view, perhaps the trend that we see today where the young high performers at the stallion licensing and stallion performance test, perhaps that is going to emulate that and if those evaluations are accurate, uh, we'll have a faster genetic process. Or I, I'd like to hear a comment about that or is, is there a way within the horse industry we can find to uh, identify early on um, uh, these talented horses so that we can make the same rate of progress. But I think you have picked two species, uh, pigs and, and uh, poultry, where the breeding is done in very standardized conditions. And our professor at Guelph, uh, Charlie Smith, he told us already, you can select uh, chicken very easy. You take the one, the biggest one for the broilers or the one who, who gets the most eggs for the, for the layers. But both cattle and horses, we have heard a lot of talks today that the environmental part is much more important, the training, the raising, and, and so on. So I, I really don't think that uh, the, your approach, or that the one yet you, you pr uh, pr put forward to uh, select for um, phenotypes at a young age is really helping us. Uh, I can add something because uh, we uh, uh, simulate populations to uh, know which is the best way to select uh, horses for competition traits. And we compare uh, different schemes with uh, selection of young horses before performance in competition, selection after performance in competition, and selection with progeny in competition. So three stages of competition or of selection. And it depends on uh, each population on the reproductive traits or uh, can we measure competition traits on both sexes, uh, how many uh, progeny a stallion can made and so on. But in our case in France, we found that the optimum was to select horses from performance competition age from five or six, so with early competition results, but also with results of relatives, so with breeding value, mm -hmm. based on uh, own competition of the horse and competition of, of sibs and uh, father, mother, and so on. It was the, the, the optimum to obtain uh, the best genetic gain. Any more questions? I may comment a little also. I think Any it's di now? difficult to compare the different species, but it is important to know the differences between the different species. And biology makes a difference for it. A sow gives birth to 25, 30 piglets a year. A horse, 0.7. So only that makes a very big difference when we, talk, uh, when we compare different uh, species and industries. But I think specifically in the horse, where we have late results in general in competitions, that's the reason why we developed the performance tests for the young horses. Young horse tests and performance tests for stallions, they are specifically important because they have a very good heritability usually. And uh, you can make use of the, these talents to further test them in competitions. Since no one else is asking questions, I, I have another uh, comment or question that um, I would be interested to, uh, to hear your, um, your comments on. With these species we're talking about, you can historically document how fast a chicken put on weight and how much milk cows were giving in 1950 and 2000 and so on. Uh, with the horses, we don't really have those kind of benchmarks. And uh, I'm wondering if there is something we should be looking at in terms of how we do this evaluation. Uh, you know, I looked at, say, the Hanoverian Society breed standards many, many years ago from, from the 1950s, and it's a much different horse that they were defining um, at that time than we are seeing uh, produced today, but I don't know that it's very well documented. 
I can try again. Um, I don't think it is so easy to compare either what is done in the chicken industry because all the feed has changed a lot. So if we measure just the phenotypic averages, they depend on uh, lots of environmental factors as well as genetic factors. The same as in horse. There are lots of uh, environmental factors that have changed as well as genetic. And I think the most reliable thing to look at is what I think Katrine and Osa were showing, the genetic trends, because that is what can be elaborated and calculated from the tests of data. The more data we have, the more reliable trends we can estimate. Mm -hmm. And we have long history of the genetic trends now in the Swedish warm blood horse, for instance, due to that we started to collect the data from the competitions already 40 years ago. Yeah, just a brief comment on that. If you, if you mean, for example, uh, yeah, really objective measurements, for sure it's easier to talk about how many more liters of milk is a, is a dairy cow producing or how many more eggs is a, is a hen producing. And we do not have uh, this similar objective measurement of, of how the performance of a horse increased um, on, for example, uh, competition results on that level. But a genetic evaluation can be, can be established for any trade. So whatever we, we come to and say, let's, let's work on that and implement a, a genetic evaluation, international genetic evaluation, then we can track and we can always do it on a genetic level, follow up the genetic trend and see, well, how well have you already uh, selected for it and how well are you doing in the next years when we have implemented the breeding <coughs> values? Do you, do you, do your breeders really use the breeding values? We can track that. And we can also possibly identify traits uh, which we can kind of measure. And, and again, the linear profiling may be also uh, something you can look at, but you can also look at the phenotypic development. But it's, it's much more difficult in, in horses when compared uh, to, to other species. So, so it's a different way of thinking we need. But there is one trait that you can easily do it with, uh, with his height. Yeah, yeah. And that has been shown in many studies that the horses are bigger. The same has happened in almost all species. Men look for bigger animals. I don't know why. <laughs> so please, we have a question from Eva Maria. Um, yeah, really, one of the things that came through at the beginning was of this, um, the project that you had before was the fact that the implementation was a challenge at the end and you, you spoke about fi uh, finances as being a, a large contributing factor. Um, and so in order that we don't see a repetition of the same issues, is there a plan then if we, if we do move ahead in a cooperative manner to ensure that we don't fall again at the same hurdle and can we all work together on that and what, what can be done? There is no plan at the moment because this was the first step that inve to investigate the interest in international genetic evaluation and if there is a solid interest we would like to go forward and uh, investigate how this can be financed both in an upstart phase and for a routine genetic evaluation in the future. But no, there's n no solution today. And of course, this is an extremely difficult question. But we will hopefully elaborate on it in, in the workshop tomorrow. And we will certainly come back to it afterwards as well. Are there any more questions from the audience? <laughs> Can, may I put, um, I have one question also that I find interesting because last year we had a seminar on genomics, right? And, and today there is a lot of discussion about genomic breeding values also for sport horses, uh, <coughs> something that the cattle industry has been using for several years now. Would you explain the, the connection uh, between the breeding values you have talked about today uh, in your speeches and genomic breeding values. Is there a connection and is one a prerequisite for the other? This question is mostly for Osa and Catherine, I think. But the others may ship in if you want to. All right, maybe I can, can start with it because we have done this exercise about exactly 10 years ago. And uh, we have found that without having a proper national genetic evaluation, we would not have been able to start with genomics at all. That is, is one important thing. 
And we have all, and then we have found out that even a big country, you have seen, we have two, two million cows, uh, dairy cows in Germany. We found out that our prediction formula with 4,000 progeny tested bulls, where we had the genotypes, was not as good enough as we wanted to have it. So we partnered with our neighbors, with, with, the, with the French, with the Scandinavian, and then we had uh, 12,000. And the only way we could use these other 8,000 that we got was through the maize collaboration in Interbol. And then the Dutch guys that first thought they could do it by themselves, they uh, called us and said, oh, we think we also would like to sit in that boat. So we had then 16,000 bulls to start with. And then we calculated how much phenotypes go into it. It was 30 million cows. Mm -hmm. uh, so without all the steps that I described today in the evolution of Interbull, we would not have been so successful in implementing uh, genomic selection in dairy cattle. And I think this experience, exp uh, you can translate not one-to-one, -one, but very close also to, to genomics in horses. So, so in brief, a normal breeding value estimation is a prerequisite to go further to <laughs> genomic breeding values, if that Most is likely. desired. Yes. Most likely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, at, at least in dairy cattle we have seen that. And as far as I know in pigs and in, in poultry, uh, where it's done by private companies, I think they do it the same way. Are there any more questions from the audience? Uh, in five minutes, the bus leaves, so we have room for at least one more question. Uh, one question regarding, uh, I was thinking about it when I heard Chris um, elaborate on just having one ranking for stallions, but international genetic evaluation, if you don't have a genetic correlation of one, produces several rankings for each country. So what if we would produce breeding values only using the FEI data? Would that be possible? Or if not, why wouldn't it be possible? Uh, it is not possible to use only FI data because uh, we have to n to evaluate the production of stallions. You have to know how many you have good production and how many you have bad production. And to have bad production, you have to have national results. It's impossible to have a good evaluation of the production of stallions based only of international data because you have to refer to the wool production of the stallion. Uh, yeah, maybe a, a very small comment. Jan had uh, addressed it uh, very briefly because we were not supposed to talk much about theory. But it, uh, genetic evaluation is always something has something to do with normal distributions. So something you have some very bad ones and some very good ones. And when you only use the best horses of all the countries and stick it together, you are talking about very very few horses all on from one side of, of your distributions. And um, if you can imagine the, the differences between these horses might not be so huge, at least not when compared to the very bad horses in the different countries. Mm -hmm. And you, you are more or less forced uh, into making severe mistakes when, when estimating breeding values only with these top horses. So, so I think there's no way to go only with the, with the uh, upper level performance. Uh, information, so FEI data, uh, stepping into a genetic evaluation. I see every time Catherine speaks, I get a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, what I'm taking away from this conversation, though, is that um, the risk is minimal. The benefits are tremendous uh, in terms of the industry, and that it will perhaps give the breeders the tools that they can begin to select, because we have to keep in mind, what is my breeding goal, my personal breeding goal? my farm breeding goal or my stud book breeding goal and uh, use these tools uh, to select and perhaps that will mean that I will decide that there is a, a stallion that is not popular but that has those, um, uh, those genetic characteristics that we want. But that brings me to the question then, it's going to be very important how we define what those, the, what the parameters are that we are, are uh, testing for and perhaps uh, uh, related, related to the question of temperament, some of these characteristics that it seems to me we focus so much on the elite sport that perhaps we're at a point where that's probably not the biggest issue. How much higher do we expect these horses to jump? But perhaps the issues that are of most importance to our breeders and to our 
our general marketplace is the temperament, the rideability, the trainability, the, the longevity, those kind of characteristics. I think it is a good summary of what we have expressed in various ways here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when we go back to Reinhardt's presentation, what we did in Interval, we started with milk production, we added confirmation, we added health traits, reproduction traits, longevity, and a number of traits that uh, forms the total index mm -hmm. that you are selecting for. Mm -hmm. But it is more easy to calculate the international breeding values for the different traits and then you pull them together in your own way mm -hmm. in the, within the country or within the stud book or for yourself mm -hmm. because you need to have a good incoming values to start with for the different traits yeah. and then you pull them together to make a total index. So, Alison, please. It's more a comment than anything else. I'd like to congratulate the panel um, and I hope that all of the work that's been done from Interstallion from its inception to now. I think at this point, part of Chris's question where he asked about potential inbreeding, I think the possibility is exciting at the moment because semen is going all over the world and people are using genetics from all over the world. The connectiveness now is probably much greater than it would have been yeah. back 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And I hope that the stud books here today appreciate that we have the expertise to do it. We now have possibilities with data that wasn't there then either. And I hope that everybody will come on board and embrace the sharing um, thinking behind this project because I think it would be of benefit for all breeders and as was demonstrated well today, particularly for the small stud books with not enough either money or, or data. Um, so I hope that the stud books tomorrow and from then on will come behind us and let this get off the ground. Thank you, thank you, Alison. I, I think actually that was, would suit us very well as last words for today <laughs> because the bus will leave. If I